the biggest difference for me, I, Iroh is very zen. Iroh is very much on one level, very much like this. And Aku is absolutely diametrically opposed. Aku is all over the place. I always say that Iroh, Iroh is acting for film. And Aku is acting for Broadway. You know, he's playing to the cheap seats in the back, you know. And I think in a nutshell, I think that's probably the reason. All right. So as good of a welcome as you did before, let's do even better for Greg Baldwin and Phil Lamar. Hello, my friends. Well, it's, the AC is so cold in there, I thought I should wear a robe. <laughs> so, how's everybody doing today? Everybody doing great? Everybody having a good time here? Yeah. Yeah. As am I. How are you doing today, Phil? Well, 50 years have passed, and <laughs> I do not age. <laughs> and yet, all you did was grow that stupid beard! <laughs> <laughs> well, he's still a samurai, not a hipster Jack. <laughs> and he, although hipster Jack would be kind of cool, I'd see that. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd tune in for that. You bet, man. <laughs> Hips got to get back to the past. Hipster Jack, yeah, baby. <laughs> hipster Jack. So I guess we're just going to kind of, uh, you know, throw the questions out to you guys and, and see, you know, any questions you have. No math questions, please. I don't know about you. You're a smart guy. You're like an Ivy League guy, right? <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> but for, as for me, no, please. 50 years ago, I could answer your smart questions. <laughs> All right. So we have, uh, we have a question right here in the front. This guy's always got something to say. <laughs> well, just so we can have a little bit of fun, how do you guys think Jack and Aku would do who's on first? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> who's on first? Who's Jack and Aku doing? <laughs> well, I think the samurai would believe that that was Aku's evil comedy. And Aku would refuse to share the stage with a foolish samurai. I will not do a bit with a samurai. I do a solo act only. Aku's on first? Aku's on second. I don't know who's on third. <laughs> All right. Well, no one knows my name either. Here's the thing. They all call me Jack. You don't know Jack. <laughs> the thing, you're, you're an improv guy, man. I mean, yeah, see, improv for me, I can, I can do it. But I used to, many years ago, I did it with Jeff Bennett at the LA Connection. Oh, and you wow. know Jeff Bennett. Jeff oh, is yes. so smart, you know. Yeah. And I can be clever if I have time to think about it, but I never could quite get, you know, like you guys, you have to be so fast. And Bennett used to just amaze me at how quick. So I would have set jokes that no matter what happened, <laughs> I would steer it to that joke. And then they would think I was terribly clever and just made it up. But in reality, it was scripted, totally scripted. So you don't want to have to improv a cartoon sometimes? <laughs> you, know, you know, not really. On Avatar and Samurai Jack, no, man. I didn't. No, I, I'm not no. going to touch those. Those lines were great. You know, you know those, when they give you those lines, they're golden. You don't want to mess with exactly. them. Exactly. And we'll just take credit for the amazing writing. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Do we have another question? Right here. Uh, I have a, it's kind of a basic question, but I think it gets the ball rolling. What was it like working on Samurai Jack, like one of the most popular cartoon shows on Cartoon Network? It was a joy. I mean, getting to work with a great genius creator like Gendy Tartakovsky is a blessing. And getting paid for it, lovely. <laughs> I mean, I, it was w the first cartoon I got to work on where the first day we come in, he had animation to show us. And he showed uh, a, like the scene from one of the early episodes where Jack is fighting those robot beetle things. And I was like, oh, wow. But it's great because it lets you feel the tone. I mean, most of the time with cartoons, you do your performance, and it's a nine months or a year before you get to see what the full thing is. Because, I mean, as the voices, we're only a third of the characters. 
you know, without the writing and the visual animation, it's not complete. But Gindy gave it to you right from the start. You know, it's interesting. I, because uh, my, my path to Samurai Jack was a little different, I was a fan of the show. You know, it came out before Avatar, so this was years before I even dreamed that I would ever be a, a, voc- uh, you know, a, a voice match for Mako Iwamatsu. And I loved this show. My son and I would watch it. My son, I think, was about eight or nine years old, and it was a show that we both loved. So literally, I would, it was something we did every week. Oh, it's Samurai Jack Night. My son and I would watch it together. And man, if you had told me then, oh, and by the way, and you know, flash forward, you're going to be the voice of Aku in 2015, <laughs> I would have said, ah, oh, man, you're crazy. There's no way that would happen. So it was sort of interesting because I was a big fan of the show. But just like just like when Avatar, a, a, the same with Avatar, my first recording session when I went in to record with you guys, uh, it was ter- it's always terrifying. Because, you know, you guys knew Ma- Mako was your friend. He was your co-worker. He was your peer. And I, I, you know, I always walk in sort of like, oh, I'm the guy that's taken over for Mako. And I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I never meant to replace Mako at all. All I wanted to do was just, you know, continue his work. And it was sort of a different audition for Samurai Jack. I never actually really auditioned. And I, I thought they had recast the role because I knew that they were going to do a season five. And it's like, well, if they haven't called me. I guess they probably replaced me. And suddenly my agent says, Gindy would like you to come through the first recording session and if he li- to see if he can direct you and see if he likes you. So literally, it was no audition. My first, it was my, my audition was the first recording session. Oh, wow. And I didn't even know. And the most beautiful words as I was leaving, Gindy said, thank you very much. I'll see you again soon. It's like, all right, I think I got the job. I don't think he would say that otherwise, you know. Well, I mean, no, it's definitely challenging to step into big shoes like you. But you had also already done it. I mean, I, like, that's funny that you say that that first session was, um, you know, uh, audition. Because I thought at that point that they, because, you know, when the show was announced that it was coming back, actually, they announced it before they called me. So... They definitely weren't doing the show without you. <laughs> well, you don't know, yeah, because six months know, earlier, yeah. they had done a, a reboot of Powerpuff Girls. Power, a recast, that's right. They, they completely, did. Yeah. like, they didn't bring back Tara Strong. I believe that that was not a successful reboot, as I recall. I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah. You know. <laughs> no. But um, when, you know, when it said, oh, we're coming back, okay, and I... You know, had to get in touch with Gendy. He's like, yeah, no, Phil, definitely. You're going to be, you are Samurai. I'm like, okay. It's like, well, what about Aku? Yeah. Well. And then I thought they chose. It's like, well, we know there is someone who can stand in Mako's shoes. You know, you had already proven it. And, and indeed, I want to say that was one of the nicest, at the, uh, the last recording session, everybody got a one sheet of uh, Samurai Jack that everyone had signed. And the most lovely thing anyone ever said to me, you wrote on this poster, shoes filled. <laughs> it's, on my, it's on my wall in my living room now. So actually, I think of you every day. I see that up there to say, ah, you know, and Gendy drew a little uh, Aku on it, actually drawn by Gendy. So it's a, it's a pretty cool poster, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I don't know. I, your name comes up a lot in interviews I have about voiceover because so many people think it's just about sounding like, you know, but I always bring you up as in person. No, 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 no. Like Greg Baldwin can sound like Mako, but what he does is he performs the character like Mako did. He's not just imitating Mako, he is performing Aku. And, you know, I mean, you hear stories all the time about voice matching or they hire somebody who just is doing an impression and they can only do the character when there's a moment in a scene that is something they have already heard. If they write a new scene, like, Aku talking yeah. about pizza. Okay. Oh, and is there a scene about that? I never, I, I never really a scene about extra thick pizza. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that you could perform the character, not just imitate everything you had heard Mako doing, 
That is you're, the achievement. You are very, you're very kind. You're very, you're very kind. I, I mean, this, this is a, Phil Lamar is the greatest guy in the world, man. And also, the, 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 with the, I, I got to be honest with you. After all this time I've been doing, I still fanboy a little bit when I'm around you. <laughs> uh, you know, frankly, I do. It's like, you know, as well as we know each other, I still like, oh my God, that's Phil Lamar. What, what am I doing in this? What am I doing in the same panel with Phil Lamar? How, how did this? How did this happen? Wow! Because I feel like somebody's going to yank me out of here at some moment. And say, sorry, wake up, Greg. Dream's over. You know. Nope. I'm back in my day job at the Disney Studios again. <laughs> Which wasn't bad, but this is better. <laughs> so you can work both sides of show business. <laughs> you have a question over here? Hi. Hello. It's so nice to see you. Um, I recently just started watching it for the first time as an adult. And I must say, going back to the first episode, I was blown away by the immediate tone and just the seriousness of a cartoon network show at a, during a time where shows were getting weird and deeper and i i just want to say it i'm i'm so amazed I'm like did, could could you feel how serious it was like the first episode is silent you don't say anything could you could you feel that and the, before it even came out, could you feel how serious and like the tone was and how different it was going to be? Well, I mean, not just seriousness. I mean, there was nobility, there was action, there was fun. But I do remember being conscious of how significant it was. I remember that first episode, I was thinking, oh my God, this might be the only American cartoon with nine minutes of non-dialogue. Certainly the only one on Cartoon Network. <laughs> Ed, Ed and Eddie never has a scene with nobody talking. <laughs> and the fact that, you know, he would tell the story, not just with what the characters say. Sometimes it's with the sound effects, it's with the lighting, it's with the, you know, action, the emotion of it. It takes you in. That's why this, I mean, I feel like Samurai Jack is one of the handful of shows. If, you, if somebody comes up to you and says, no, nah, no, nah, I don't like cartoons. You could say, watch this one. And they will, oh, wow. You know, even pe people who don't like cartoons but just like to go to museums, they'll like Samurai Jack because it's art. I think as someone once said, I said, you could take literally any, you could take any frame from the show, any frame from the show, it might have been you, and put it on your wall as art. I mean, the show is that good. Every, every single frame is art. Yeah. All right, we have another question right here. So uh, I have one for, uh, for Greg here. Uh, first of all, Thankfully, someone did manage to record the original Cabbage karaoke song from last night. She'll be... Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I can have her send that to you whenever you'd like. And um, second of all, given the conversation we had about 10 minutes ago, this got me thinking, what would Aku's dream role for a musical be? <laughs> Sweeney Todd, of course. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. Right. <laughs> they all deserve to die. Tell you why, Mrs. Lovett. Tell you why. <laughs> wow, that was weird. <laughs> it is true. The evil wizard would like to kill people, but he would not be able to make their hair. <laughs> Speaking of hair, how does my toupee look? It looks good? <laughs> you look good, you know? Nobody believes it's a toupee. <laughs> it really is. All right, do we have another question? Right here, this gentleman. Thanks. Uh, this one's for Mr. Baldwin, I guess, mostly. Um, Doing the two characters for Aku and Iroh, one being a demon wizard and the other being a firebending master, they both sound similar, but yet they're two completely different roles. So I was kind of wondering if you had any comparisons and contrasts to 
the two characters and like the subtle nuances you do to make them who they are? Well, you know, the, the biggest difference for me, I, Iroh is very zen. Iroh is very much on one level, very much like this. And Aku is absolutely diametrically opposed. Aku is all over the place. I always say that Iroh, Iroh is acting for film. And Aku is acting for Broadway. You know, he's playing to the cheap seats in the back, you know. And I think, in a nutshell, I think that's probably the reason. You know, the difference. You know, I also like the fact that the yin and yang aspect of the two characters, you know, because we all, we all aspire to be more like Uncle Iroh. But every now and then, you just have to have an Aku day. In fact, and a lot of times when I'm like, when I'm, especially when I'm on the website formerly known as Twitter, where I shouldn't be and neither should you, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, I literally, I think it's sometimes I'm about to tweet something and it's like, Greg, do you really want to put that out into the universe? There's so much poison already. And you know, Aku's over here. Ah, oh, send it. You're a coward. Hit send. Now. <laughs> so the yin and yang aspect of the two characters. And you know, we're all, what is that old song? I'm a little bit country. I'm a little bit rock and roll. I'm a, we're all a little bit Iroh and a little bit Aku, I think, you know? Yeah. You know, on a, on a metaphysical sort of way, yes. <laughs> We were talking before. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh. oh, please. I, uh, we're actors. We hate applause. Uh, yeah, please. Please, please. We were talking before about um, uh, memories that people had of the show. And he was sharing how, as, uh, as a child, they, he used to play Sam Samurai Jack. You know, they would uh, pretend to be the, the characters, you know. Is that something that you guys ever thought about when you were making that show? That, hey, kids are going to be pretending to be these guys. No, no. <laughs> I, I want to. I'm not sure. I want to meet the kid that wants to play Aku. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Do we have another question over here? Take a little walk. Hi. So, out of all your recordings, what is the funniest mistake or? funny moment you've ever made? You know, yeah, I don't, I don't either, because generally I'm so terrified and when I'm in the booth, I try not to make any mistakes. <laughs> you know, I'm always afraid, I'm always afraid they're going to fire me, you know, if it takes more than two takes to get it done. Right. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if I remember any mistakes. Not, I'm not really on Samurai Chower Avatar. I'm trying to think about mistakes. No, not, not. Oh, well, actually, it's funny. I was just, when you were talking just now about, you know, um, Mako's two different characters, I was thinking about a mistake in my head. Um, there was an episode, and this was, you know, early in my career in voiceover, and I remember I was so impressed being in the booth next to Mako, you know? It's like, oh my God, this guy has been in movies. He's been on Broadway. You know, his name above Stephen Sondheim's yeah, on posters. Um, but then one episode, they said, you know, I heard Gendy say, oh, and um, Mako, just want to let you know, there's, there's another character um, on the, in this episode that you're going to be voicing. I was just, and I remember thinking to myself, what? He has got the most unique sounding voice. You know, it's like, if he does another character, people are just going to think, oh, Aku has just changed into that thing. Because, you know, I was thinking his voice is so unique. But then, he didn't just, like, transform. He didn't just make his voice sound like this. No, but he performed the other character in a completely different way than he performed Aku. And you watch that episode and you can't tell it's him. And basically, I was taking a voice acting class that day. And Mako taught me that it's called voice acting, but the acting is more important than the voice. I was like, oh, oh, wow. Now I've learned this. Oh, I just took a master class. <laughs> But, I mean, that was a mistake, because, you know, back in those days, I was thinking, it's all about 
making a voice. Everything you say is this. It's all about that. But like, no, it's about performance. And he taught me that. So thankfully, as a producer, I didn't make a mistake and not cast Mako for a second character. I envy you, though, having met him, because, you know, the, oddly enough, the Internet is wrong. The Internet says I was his understudy, which is a silly thing to say, <laughs> because, you know, as you know, an understudy is something you have on stage. An understudy is someone that looks like you that goes on when you're not able to do the stage, you know, the show. And, you know, Maka, you would never mistake Mako and Greg Baldwin for the same person. Never. But I would let you know, I, I do envy you having met him. I actually the weirdest thing. Actually, he had never showed up before. He showed up in a dream of mine recently, which I thought was kind of cool because he had never showed up in a dream you think he would have because he's such a part of my life and I don't remember I don't remember much about the dream I just remember waking up and go wow Mako was in my dream uh, and I was like I wish I could remember what he said to me you know I hope it wasn't Greg you suck they should they should have they should have hired someone else I don't think he said that <laughs> but yeah it was kind of weird you know I, and I actually now I say rather than I say you know when I go to meet my maker I say I ah, when I go to meet Mako but in 20 years or so yeah all right, do we have another question? Back here, this gentleman. Uh, I know you guys were talking about like your early days in uh, voice acting and stuff. Uh, what got you guys into voice acting like at the beginning of it? You know, I, I sort of fell into it. You know, I didn't, I didn't really go and move to L.A. thinking I'd like to be a voice actor. I just wanted to be an actor. Uh, my wife and I met at the University of Houston Theater Department a long, long time ago before anyone in this room was born. Uh, and we moved to L.A. in 87. I was very lucky to get my SAG card doing some McDonald's commercials. But then our children were born 11 months apart. So I was very busy for like the next you know, six or seven years. Once my kids were getting a little older, they started elementary school. I said, you know, I kind of miss acting. I'd like to go back and do a play. And so I did a, a play in Los Angeles, a show called Bullshot. No, was it Bullshot Crumman? I think it was Bullshot Crumman, uh, where I played several different roles. And the director said, you know, you're actually pretty good with voices. Why don't you go? My friend Sue Blue is a casting cast for animation and also teaches. Why don't you go take a Sue Blue's class, which I did. And she liked me enough and was gracious enough to call and get me my first agent. And, you know, and after that, everything just sort of, you know, happened, you know. Destiny is a funny thing. You never know how things are going to work out. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Actually, um, technically, I got into voice acting before that description phrase existed. Back in the 80s, in high school, I got a job doing a voice in a cartoon. The Mr. T cartoon. I remember it. I remember it. Uh, it was this weird sort of Scooby-Doo ripoff where Mr. T was coaching a gymnastics team that would travel around solving mysteries where their gymnastics tournaments were. Um, and I was playing one of the kids on the team as a kid, which back in the 80s was rare that they would actually hire children to play children. Oh, yeah. um, but, you know, I was doing plays, but I didn't feel like this was acting. Maybe because I remember one of our directors said, kids, kids, remember, and all the lines up. That gives the children more energy when they're listening. I'm like, what? I'm sorry your dog died. Phil, Phil, up! <laughs> sorry your dog died. Good, moving on. <laughs> it's like, so that was not acting. That was just working on a cartoon. But um, later, after going to college, coming back to LA and pursuing acting, and after cable TV came along and increased the amount of animation, you know, once Nickelodeon had 24 hours of children's programming, voice acting actually became a thing. It's like, because, you know, for most people wanting to be actors, you didn't think about, no, 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 I'm not going to get on a microphone. I don't want to work on the radio. But by the 90s, you saw, oh, that is a path you can go down. And after doing Mad TV, where we were doing sketches where you got to play 
multiple characters in an episode. And you wasn't focused just on the voice, but you do make them sound differently. And um, it got me into the idea that, well, we also did animation on Mad TV. We did these claymation things. And I was like, oh, wow. I, I feel good working on a mic. Raging Rudolph. Yes. I remember that well. Right. Classic. And so at one point I decided I'm going to pursue the cartoon path. And then I got super lucky because there was some agent who hired, you know, represented a lot of sketch people for commercials. I'm like, I don't like to do commercials, but do you have a voiceover department? He's like, oh, yeah, we do. I'm like, yes. But then the big luck was the casting agency that cast Mad TV was also casting the new show of the creator of The Simpsons. And that's how David Herman and, and I, and actually Nicole Sullivan, all wound up on Futurama at the start. Show called Futurama. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's a good way to start. Yeah. Cartoons. All right, we have another question right here. Hello. What is some of the like uh, other genres like gaming, um, movies, whatever that you guys like would like to work on that you might not have been on? Like, is there like a movie or a game or a show that you would like like to be on that you just aren't or something like that? I, I don't know, I'll let you do your answer. But for me, it's not about medium, it's about quality. Like, when you get to work, you know, on the material from a Matt Groening or a Gendy Tartakovsky, that's the same as working with the material from a Quentin Tarantino. You know? And the thing is, you can do something crappy in any medium on a mic, on a stage, on a camera, and when it's not good work or good directing or good material, like that Mr. T cartoon, <laughs> it's hard. You know, I, we were talking earlier, I do, my, my first love was the theater. I do miss, I would love to go back and do some theater again. Unfortunately, theater happens on Fridays and Saturdays, you know, and sun, you know, and Saturdays, and so do fan conventions, and you know, fan. <laughs> just between you and me, fan conventions pay a lot better than the theater. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. So my, my my choice is sort of made for me, but I really, I really do miss the theater. I would love to go back. As I get older, the parts that I would be able to play are fewer. But I, I very much, the first, the first role I ever played was Ebenezer Scrooge in my fourth grade production of A Christmas Carol. I would like, before I go out, to play Scrooge one more time now that I'm the right age for it, you know? Well, and now you can play King Lear without doing any makeup. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, who has another one? Over here. Um, this might have been asked before I came in, but um, what are your thoughts on, like, the final season of Samurai Jack? Um, just, like, the script, like, is there anything you would have changed or did you envision, like, that's how the story would end, like, a little bit more mature themes of a like, depressed older Jack and the love angle and just your thoughts, if if you envisioned it when you started, it ending any differently or were there things you'd change? No, I don't, there's no way to envision that Gendy would take the 12-year gap between season four and season five and evolve the series. To me, the season five, the conclusion season, feels like what the show would have grown to had it kept going for every season for those 12 years. It's like, we keep going, we keep going, we keep going. But... Samurai has still not solved his mission. And maybe that affects him badly. You know? Yeah, it's like, okay, yeah, if you're fighting a war for 50 years without winning, you ain't gonna feel good. <laughs> you're gonna be a little, depre a little depressed. But, but also, when we come towards the end, let's give him love for the first time. And to me, 
I mean, although it's funny, because I remember when we first, when we started the season, I asked Gendy, because 10 years ago, he had talked about making a movie version of Samurai Jack. It's like, so is this the same ending that you were going to do when you were talking about making a movie? It's like, mm, not the same, but I don't know, might make you cry a little. <laughs> and I was like, what? But I did tear up when we were recording it. But to me, I know a lot of people had problems with the ending, but to me it felt on theme because so many times the samurai had a chance to get into a time portal, but he sacrificed, he gave up because someone else needed that, that magic wish or something and he would sacrifice. But this time, Ashi sacrificed herself for him and he sacrificed his love for his world and his family and his father's empire. So it was about sacrifice. Yeah. Well, and there was no blood in the first four seasons. <laughs> but, I, but I loved how the more mature themes now, I was, I was like, oh, I get this now. I'm older yeah. Than that, that was a brilliant approach. I don't, I, I don't think I could add anything. You, you put it very eloquently. You know, it was, a, it was the perfect ending, a perfect bittersweet ending. Uh, from a selfish point of view, I wouldn't have minded voicing Aku for another season or so. But that's where, <laughs> that's, that's literally, yeah, purely selfish. I think the ending was absolutely perfect the way it was. Although I do Just the best thing about the ending is ending a oh, cool. And but did, you know the last the last shot I think is the ladybug, right? Yes. Is, and those are also Aku colors. I just <laughs> saying you never know. Maybe you know. Well, I I, I always dreamed that Ashi was in the lady her soul was inside the ladybug. So maybe his love is still alive. So yeah, we need a spin-off. I like it. <laughs> Samurai bug. <laughs> I, I had an idea for a spinoff. I actually, I was doing some podcast or something with Gendy, and Gendy was on. I forget when it was, and I uh, hate he didn't like the idea. I actually pitched him on a hate night with Aku, <laughs> very much a coast, you know, space ghost, coast to coast, very much in that genre. And Gendy was like, "Oh, Greg, no, 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 no." no. All right, do we have another question? We go right over here. Yeah, well, we we didn't write or storyboard any episodes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so. Amongst all of your shows that you have worked on, I know Michael and I kind of talked beforehand, uh, there are a lot of lessons to be learned amongst the different shows. Like I know with Static Shock, um, the episode on gun violence kind of taught me at an early age about watching out for social cues and things of that nature for kids and everything like that. Are there any lessons between the episodes or any of the script reads and stuff like that that really kind of stuck with you both? in regards to your personal lives or just things that kind of helped evolve you as people? Well, Aku hasn't really helped me evolve as a person. <laughs> <laughs> but Iro has ab although you, absolutely... Although yeah. you, you have changed your look. Indeed, I have definitely, I have shaved, yeah, I've shape shifted, you know, I've dressed differently than I used to, you know. I'm in my Elton John period in my, in my late, my late life. Uh, but Iroh has definitely helped me. Uh, I was, uh, specifically, he has so many wise, you know, obviously, and, and it, it's helpful that I memorize most of his, his wise sayings. My wife and I was back and we had, uh, our children were grown. We lived in LA for 30 years and we, you know, let's, let's live a more chill life. Let's move back to New Mexico where I was born. If we can just have a little more quiet life there. And so we sold our house in LA, said goodbye to all of our friends, moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico on March 1st, 2020. So two weeks later, the world is shut down. We're freaking out. I literally remember going out for a walk because I get so tired of watching the news. And I was just going for a walk in a town that I did not know. And, you know, and I was thinking, oh, my God, you know, what have we done? I have a child on the East Coast and a child on the West Coast. And we've left them and we've left our friends and there's no toilet paper and we're all going to die. And this is terrible. And uh, I could hear a flock of birds singing and a line from uh, the legend of Korra. I, I could hear it in my head. If you look for the light, you will often find it. If you look for the dark, that is all you will ever see. 
And from that point on, even beyond COVID, when I'm feeling depressed or angry or whatever, I try to go back to that line. And what I love about that line is it, it, it's not just a fancy way of saying try to be positive because it involves an act of choice. If you, look, if you look for the light, you have to make that choice to look for the light. And once you do, once you say, I'm not going to wallow in the darkness anymore, and you start to look for the light, you'll realize, man, we are enveloped by light. Light is everywhere we look. Even at night, you can look up and see stars. So you, without a doubt, Iroh has made me a better human being, undoubtedly. Okay, who's got another one? Back here. So um, this question is for Phil, but I imagine Greg probably has some thoughts on it too. So obviously when season five, uh, you know, came the show came back and I, I, I guess I was curious, um, and I've always been curious about that, but this with voice actors is, is there any anxiety with being able to maintain the voice, do it in the same way that it used to. I mean, I imagine you know, there's that time skip, so there might be expectations that it will sound different. But when you come back to do a character you haven't done for so long, how do you maintain it, especially as you get older and your voice is just going to naturally change on its own? Um, no, there's, there's never any you know, bad feeling about coming back to a show this good. You know, um, I mean, I'm sure it's like Laurence Olivier doing another production of Hamlet. Yeah. He's like, yes, I will do it. Um, it. To do shows for a long period of time, there is a certain level of challenge because we change. But we also know that that doesn't, you know, make things bad. I mean... I'm sure many of us hear the difference in the Bugs Bunny voices over the years. You know, Mel Blank was always him, but he had different sounds. But he was still making it Bugs Bunny. So even though Bugs sounds different, you know, it's like, well, our parents sound different over time, but they're still our parents. Um, I mean... To me, the best challenge was the fact that Jack was in a completely different emotional state than he had ever been. And I remember sitting in the room thinking, okay, I've got to bring back the hero, this noble, you know, strong man, but I've got to sound how this noble, strong man would sound with some sorrow and sadness inside him. So do both. Um, and I thought that was a great story. So, um, yeah, it wasn't scary. It was great. All right, do we have another one? Right here. Hi. So... Actually, I asked this for Greg, but also Phil's idea. So yesterday we were talking, you mentioned how you were pitching a, an idea for like a live action movie or a series of Samurai Jacks. So I want to know how you guys would picture that if you had creative control over it. Oh, I wouldn't want to have creative control over that. I, I just think, specifically watching Fallout recently, uh, and, and then before that, Last of Us, they're really getting, finally getting a handle on how to take these projects that, that uh, you know, you wouldn't think would work cinematically, and they're actually working now. And I think in the hands of a right director, I don't want creative control. This would have to be Gendy in some, you know, uh, in the right hands, I think, yeah, I think Samurai Jack, a live action, re would be pretty cool. I, I would watch that. I think, I think it could be done. But I, I don't want, no, creative control over that. No, thank you. You know, <laughs> not at all. Actually, it's funny that you bring this up because... Back in the beginning of the series, when the show was doing really well, they were talking about doing a live action Samurai Jack. There was some um, big time movie producer who had Gendy write up a treatment for the live action version. But then the guy was like, wait a minute, no, no, I'm watching, I love this cartoon so much, but 
No. If we just start shooting it with people, it's not going to be as good as the cartoon. It's just going to seem like a, you know, a kung fu movie. So they ended up, he ended up not going forward with it. But there was the thought. This, this thing is so good. Well, you know, like so nowadays with, the, with great video games, they think, let's make a movie of it. And they usually can't make it right. They, yeah, and you, that's what amazed, that's what, actually what amazed me with Fallout, because I've ne I'd never seen one so fully, I, I, I'd never even played the game. I, I didn't know really, even though I voiced one of the games, I, I'd never played the game. Uh, and I was amazed. Wow, this is an awesome world. And they really built it well. And it was interesting to me. And my, some, you know, generally studio, having worked behind the scenes at the Walt Disney Studios, it always expect studio executives to do the stupid wrong thing. <laughs> you know, in this case, clearly they did the right thing. And the, and the same with uh, The Last of Us. And I also think the, the Avatar uh, live action reboot, compare, comparatively, especially to the film that we don't talk about, the film that doesn't exist, I think is like so much, so much better than that. You know, people expect it to be the animated show, and it, it can't be because it's live action. But you know, I, it's it's interesting. There are some things I'd like to see. I'd like to see a live action. Again, thinking of Fallout got me thinking about Bioshock, and what an interesting film that would be. But again, this has a lot of things have to happen. You have to have the right executives. You have to have the right creative team in place. Uh, and if just one of those pieces isn't there, the whole thing could end up sucking, as things usually do. So. But they could be done, if they do it right, yeah. it could be great, because be great. to tell a great story in a different way is a good thing. You know, I mean, that's why those Harry Potter movies were good. Which they're rebooting and doing another, which, which I, I don't think enough time has passed for that, but that's just me, you know. <laughs> yeah. give, it, give it 20 years. We have another one over here. Hi, question. You talked about it a little bit, but when you first find out, find out that Samurai Jack was coming back, how did you find out and what were your thoughts? Because I read it on Reddit, rolled my eyes and thought, ah, no, this is false. Just another, oh, this person's dead and they're, they're actually just in Boca. Uh, well, I think I said it before. They put out a, um, you know, ad or public, you know, the Cartoon Network said, we're bringing back Samurai Jack. I heard it on the news, but not from my agent. So that was scary. Yeah. But then I called Gendy and he said, yeah, yeah, no, I'm doing it. Because that's the other thing. Sometimes you, you, they do a reboot without the great creator. But no, it's like, nope, they, <laughs> no, Gendy's doing it. Oh, okay. And he's like, and Phil, you're going to be doing it. Like, oh, all right, good. So it stopped being scary. <laughs> a friend of mine, I didn't know, a friend of mine called me up and said, hey, I saw this on the news. They're rebooting Samurai Jack. Have they contacted you? And I said the same thing. No, they haven't. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then actually this friend said, okay, well, if, they do, if you do get to play Aku, there's only two words you really need to learn how to say. And you know those two words. <laughs> <laughs> Extra thick. <laughs> I said, okay. I, I didn't even know about the extra thick meme at this point. And I started going through this. Oh, wow, man, that's weird. <laughs> I mean, I think there, there was a, they had Aku just saying extra thick for like 24 hours straight on one of those YouTube channels. Very odd, very strange. Strange. Yeah. Okay, we have one right here. Sure, I have, I have a two-parter. It's, it's open to either of you gentlemen. Um, it kind of piggybacks off the last question. If you had creative control over a live action project and you could cast whoever you want to play um, your uh, John Stewart or Samurai Jack or Aku or Iro or, you know, um, who would that be? And what characters, what would be, what would be either of your dream characters to voice? I wouldn't mind playing the Joker. Voicing, voicing the Joker would be pretty cool. Or the Penguin. I like, you know, in terms of, I've never done any DC projects, so that'd be cool. Uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. I think we've already gone there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't dream of portraying any characters. I mean, because if you watch something 
that's good, then that's it. You know, it's not like watching Rocky and go, oh, damn it, I wish I was playing the boxer. <laughs> you know, um, but um, although it's funny because, you know, growing up as a comic book fanboy nerd, you know, Batman was my hugest, you know, character. But I got to work next to Batman. But now we've lost Kevin Conroy. And it's tricky to think about playing that. Actually, I remember several years back, Warner Brothers was sending out auditions for the Looney Tunes characters, and they sent out a CD of all the Mel Blanc voices. And I didn't send in an audition. Because every time I did it, I still heard my voice in it. Didn't sound like him. I guess that's, well, I guess Eric Bowser is smarter than me. I would cast Paul Sun Hyung Lee as Uncle Iroh. <laughs> yes, <they laughs> that was easy. It, it, it happened. So yeah, that was an easy answer. Mm, I don't know. Actually, I keep thinking that my uh, my friend Matt King could be the live action Samurai Jack because he is so handsome and powerful and strong, and um, he he's also um, the voice of Liu Kang in the Mortal Kombat series. And he is um, Appa in the live-action Avatar. Um, and he was, one, he, was, um, he was on the Riverdale show, so he works on camera as well as on mic. So I'm thinking, oh, he could do it. John Stewart, where Aku? John Stewart, where Aku? Well... <laughs> For John Stewart, I always think, and uh, it, it would depend. It would depend on the script, the story, what was the performance. But in my head, it's always the guy who was auditioning for Green Lantern right ahead of me. And the actor Dennis Haysbert, the on-camera actor, because he looks like the Bruce Tim drawing. He's huge. He's got that square jaw and that incredibly deep voice. So, like, yeah, if they were gonna do a live action movie, they'd have cast him, not Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I believe we have another one right here. Complete change of like everything. So, considering you started talking about Harry Potter. <laughs> If you have been sorted, what houses are you sorted into? If you haven't, what houses would you like to be in? I'm, I'm Slytherin. Very, very proud about that, actually. I, 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 I'm happy to be a Slytherin, yeah. The, the, one of the most heroic characters in all of fiction was a Slytherin, and I will die on that hill. You're so good at being a villain. I, Phil, I'm, did you I'm have not, one? I'm not uh, as deep into my my kids were deep into the Harry Potter world. <laughs> I never read them, <laughs> but I did take them to the movies. Uh, all right, we got one back here. Hi, how you two doing? What was it like the work of Kevin Conroy being Green Lantern to him in the Justice League? Oh, in the Justice League cartoon. Uh, was working with uh, Kevin Conroy as Batman. It was a joy because, I mean, it was, a, it was again, it was another masterclass because here you had this theater on-camera actor who then moved into cartoons and again showed us that it was voice acting because he, to, to my feeling as a Batman fan, he made Batman cool again, not just campy, I mean, I like Adam West, but I didn't like his version of Batman as much I'm right there with as I like the comic book version. <laughs> but to me, Kevin's performance did exactly what Neil Adams' artwork did for comics in the 70s. He made you feel that this non-superpowered hero 
was as good as all of the others on the, in the Justice League, you know? Um, although, one year at a con, as a Batman fanboy nerd, I goofed up and introduced Kevin Conroy and Neil Adams. You guys are both the cool Batman people to me! Here, Kevin, meet Neil. Neil, meet Kevin. So, that was, that was, that was a fanboy win. <laughs> I'd have probably done the same thing there, honestly. Yeah. All right, we're coming down. We got probably time for maybe two more. Who's got some really good ones here? <laughs> <laughs> Putting you on the spot. This guy right here. Uh, for me, for me, uh, one of the episodes that really stuck out for Samurai Jack was the uh, the bugs with like the crystal arrows and like uh, the piggy bank uh, on the head, I believe. Uh, and it, or was that right? And then uh, Jack versus the Dark Bad Jack uh, episode. And I was wondering, for both of you with just different uh, series that you've voiced, is there any episodes that have really stuck with you uh, that you just uh, seem to have met something really special having voiced? Uh, I like I liked Aku's fairy tales. And again, that was something I watched with my kid when I had no idea I would ever be Aku. That's something that really, you know, struck me. Uh, and I, I like, I really... Uh, I like the next to last episode of all time. I like that one. I can't, I can't, and I can't remember why I liked it so much. Oh, no, I do, because I didn't think I sucked in it. I remember <laughs> listening to it, because I, I, I remember when it starts out, and of course I'm a little nervous, and it was all done in order of episodes. So I think in the, the psychiatrist scene, I'm still just sort of settling into it. Wow, this is way different from Iroh. And I think I remember, because it was the second to last episode where I was watching with my wife, and I finally went, oh, that's a, that's, that sounds pretty good. All right, Baldwin, that's not so bad. Yeah. Ironically, my wife loved Samurai Jack, watched every episode of it. She's never watched a single episode of Avatar The Last Airbender. Oh, wow. What's up with that, huh? I know, I know. What yeah. can I do? What can I do? I don't tell her what to do. That's why I've been married Does your wife years. own a sword? <laughs> <laughs> she, said, she likes Vanderpump rules, you know? She likes all that reality, that real housewife. Real housewives of bossing say, I put, put that, put a, put a, put a pin in that, put a pin in that. <laughs> it just came oh to me. Oh my gosh, that would be funny. Earth Queens. I mean, I've, there's so many great episodes that I love. Um, you remember the old, it's like, you know, Aku was like, you can fly? No, jump good. You know, he's, be, Jack gets taught how to jump so high. Um, also, the rave episode. <laughs> Although I remember back in the day going like, oh my God, we could talk about a rave on Cartoon Network? Go ahead, Gandy. Uh, um, I mean, so many great ones. Uh, yeah, the, the fairy tale one was fantastic. Um, and in the, new, the final season, the episode where he you know, goes after the, the black girls and draws blood with his sword for the first time. I thought that was powerful. Um, but yeah, there, there's tons that really just like hit me. All right. Well, it's, uh, it's been wonderful to be able to have you guys and to, uh, to get to talk about this wonderful show. We like to send people off with, uh, with one final thing. If your characters could say something about having gone to Altoona, Pennsylvania, <laughs> what would your characters say? <laughs> it was a living hell. <laughs> I want to get back to my palace. Well, which character? I think one character would say, hey, you, you, "It's gonna rain." <laughs> <laughs> We're not gonna beat that. So, how about a big hand for <laughs> Phil Lamar and Greg Baldwin? <laughs> Hey there, this is Nolan North, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Good for you. Very proud of you. Now go watch more. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom. I like that. I like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs>